this presentation is uh, divided into four sections. I will be kick off, kicking off with uh, a short explanation uh, of uh, the Chinese ID tech ecosystem. And then following by the key uh, growth driver in China, trends in artificial intelligence application in Chinese school. And uh, finally, the opportunity and the challenges for uh, Europe ID tech companies in China. So first, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, ID, ID tech ecosystem. And to fully understand the Chinese ID tech phenomenon, we need to look at these five pillars or dimensions and how they can they contribute to an effective environment for ID tech grow, go, going forward. Uh, first, companies, the breadth and the depth of uh, ID tech landscape and the availability and, and the sources of ID tech capital. Uh, the maturity of the ID tech community and the, the, the level of government support and also the quality, size and accessibility of uh, local education sector as a test bed. First, let's uh, have a look at the companies. Uh, in China, there are uh, three uh, groups of companies that play important roles in ID tech development. First, traditional companies such as uh, New Oriental, Tall, they understand the functions of education and they expect technology to expand their existing provisions. The second group, technology companies like Huawei, Tencent, they are keen to extend their technologies to serve the demands in the education sector. The third group of startups who use technology to provide new services and uh, disrupt the existing market. Furthermore, there are th 3,000 ID tech companies in Beijing and 2,000 in Shanghai. So uh, China's education industry is a favorite for capital investment. In 2018 alone, ID tech investment, investment totaled $3.3 billion, twice as much as in the United States and four times as much as in Europe. The most active connected ID tech uh, communities can be found in China. For example, Zhongguanzun in Beijing's Haidian district is China's uh, version of Silicon Valley. There are over 70 ID tech companies in the MOOC Times building that provide educational content and the services as part of China's booming online education e economy. Many events and uh, conferences have been hosted by the innovation hub of uh, Zhongguanzun Internet Institute uh, to bring investors, founders, and educators together with uh, the single aim for further accelerating ID tech across China. Uh, over the past five years, ID tech companies in China have benefited from increased government encouragement uh, through policies, financial support for ID tech, including intro introduction of educational related policies, especially the next generation IC, uh, AI development plan, AI innovation action plan in colleges, universities, and the Chinese uh, China's Education Moder Modernization 2035. The goals were to encourage the development of AI in education and the force more AI talents and the commercializing research. Uh, China have the largest K-12 populations uh, globally, and the cities like Beijing, Shanghai, with a high concentration of schools, are uh, eager to innovate around education delivery. They openly work with ID tech companies to introduce innovative classroom practice and education technologies. 
um, key growth drivers. China has a massive education market with 283 million students from nursery to higher education. By comparison, the United States has 77 million, the UK has 12.5 million, and Australia has 5.3 million. China also has the world's largest digital learning market with 172 million online learners and 142 million mobile learners. Uh, family spending. In 2018, Chinese households spend 21% of their total family income on education and 33 point of education spending was on education educational apps. Uh, in America, the figures at 2% uh, and uh, uh, in UK, 1.5% and in Australia, 4.3%. I have quoted the sources. Uh, in recent years, the Chinese government has published a number of policies and strategy on education reform to improve quality and equality of education in China. They include the university entrance examinations and the curriculum reforms. China has also made the STEM course, uh, STEM course uh, uh, compulsory in schools. Uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that technology plays a vital role in modernizing Chinese education system. So another drive is uh, after school tutoring in China. The key 12 after school tutoring market is worth about uh, uh, 600 billion RMB. That's around uh, 67 billion pounds. As you can see here, the top five education companies only have less than 5% of market share nationally. There are still many players in this field locally. Uh, after school education programs in China tend to fall into three key uh, categories, English language learning, um, preparation for national examinations, and the tutoring on STEM topics. Technology development. China has rapidly adopted the internet. Uh, there are currently over 800 million users, uh, of which 788 million are also mobile phone users. Uh, online transactions have grown at 32% uh, annually over the last five years, and mobile pay payments are very popular. This creates an avenue for B2C ID tech companies to seamlessly uh, commercialize their products. So as I have already pointed out, Chinese companies have invested heavily in developing advanced technologies in teaching and learning, particularly in the latest development in big data, AI, and blockchain in education. So let's have a look at AI-powered ID tech developments in China. So first, I'd like to um, uh, uh, talk about a few examples of use of AI in education in China. Uh, Square AI, a Shanghai-based online after-school tutoring company, provide personalized education at scale. Like other, con other countries with large land masses, China suffers from an uneven distribution of resources and the talent. The nation's top teachers are concentrated in the big cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Their schools uh, also have the best equipment. Uh, education in the more rural parts of China often suffer from lack of qualified teachers and resources. So Square AI promised to use the intelligent adoptive learning system to address the challenges of lack of qualified teacher and high quality education resources in small cities and rural areas in China. 
So they adopted an online learning model and the learning center model with 70% of AI teacher with 30% of human coach. So far, they have established 1,900 learning center in 400 cities with nearly 2 million students. Another example is uh, uh, iFly Tech. Uh, they specialize in intelligent speech and voice recognition. Their translation technologies and services allow teachers and students to communicate across more than 30 languages. Their objective is to advance human and machine speech to the level of human to human conversations, thereby advance interactive learning to new level. Uh, NetDragon, it is a company for online gaming, uh, mobile technology, online education, and VR, AR. In recent times, they have uh, acquired uh, Cherry Peaks, um, Promising, Jumpstart, etc. The company recently introduced the world, world first AI teaching assistant. The AI teaching assistant provides customize the homework and provide uh, feedback to students' assess, uh, assignments. The voter uh, teacher assistant can also use voice recognition to handle questions posted by students and provide them with uh, relevant answers. So now let's look at some opportunity and the challenges uh, for um, in for uh, IT tech company in Europe. So. First, uh, first uh, the UK and China has different perspectives on AI-enabled education. In China, most uh, uh, common conversations uh, are focused on how AI can be used to enhance the quality of teaching, improve student learning, and increase equality. Uh, in the UK and Europe, there are many concerns about uh, ethics and uh, privacy issues, how AI might uh, screw up bad pedagogies, and how algorithms could uh, amplify human bias, etc. And also, there are different approaches in China, uh, like, uh, like AI in any other uh, industry. There's an AI lead approach. A number of large scale e experimental implementations are around AI have allowed the technology to be introduced to, uh, in universities and, and schools. Examples include apps for language learning and homework and the facial recognition in the classroom. Uh, furthermore, the educational system in China has a very well-defined curriculum and the emphasis on teaching to test, creating an environment where AI applications are easy to implement. Uh, however, in the UK and Europe, uh, AI has been mostly used to assist the administrative tasks for teachers, provide more flexible progress through the education system, and develop student skills uh, for 21st century, such as uh, creative thinking, creativity, and uh, communication, etc. So the UK approach are more conservative on AI application in education. It's very difficult to test the AI application in real school setting. So in terms of business opportunities, uh, first, I think it is important to uh, connect the EduTech ecosystem in Europe and China to bridge the gaps of uh, capital provider so we can attract more funding for research-based and evidence-informed AI products in Europe. We also need to create an active, connected EduTech communities. Many Chinese EduTech companies have approached academics in US, UK, Europe to seek for new ideas and opportunities for collaboration. Hopefully, there's more opportunity for UK, Europe EduTech companies who could participate and benefit from the connected ecosystems. And 
Second, uh, there's no doubt there's a massive education market for high quality UK Europe education products and services uh, in China. It is, however, it is important to work with the Chinese companies through partnerships to better understand the market and localize the products to meet the needs of students. And third, the opportunity to work collaboratively for research and the development on ethic, pedagogically sound AI application in education. So finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you some of the work I've been doing at Warlen uh, and how we attempt to address this opportunity and the challenges. So I founded Warlen in 2015, and it's a small scale China-based online learning platform, which I've been developed to facilitate the UK academic and the university here to build in partnerships with Chinese university and engage with Chinese students through online courses and the digital technology. It provides a test bed for new pedagogical practice and the new tools and applications for online and distance learning. A number of collaborative projects have been developed to support collaborations on edtech research and the development uh, in uh, learning, uh, learning analytics, intelligent computers, and uh, uh, AI as well. So that's for me. Thank you for your listening. It has been a pleasure being here with you today. Thank you, thank you, Lee. Um, so, uh, as um, that, it gives us a very good overview of how the Chinese edutech industry uh, is and what opportunities. So now we're going to go into part two, uh, where I'm going to um, talk to you about how to turn some of the opportunities into sales for you if you're looking indeed to sell into the Chinese market. So first, if we start from a question, should you actually consider doing business with China? Here we say engage. It could be selling to China, it could be doing collaboration with China, it could be you're looking to source from China or attract talent from China. Whichever way, uh, we, there are some pros and cons that um, we can consider. So first, as you can see from Li's uh, presentation, China presents a huge market for education and education tech companies. We are talking about hundreds of thousands in numbers, not hundreds of schools. I was in China two weeks ago uh, visiting a Chinese company that um, operates a platform for training to nursery teachers across China. And they are less than two years old. Uh, however, they're already providing services to 20,000 nurseries across the country. And they told me that in China, there are altogether half a million nurseries. That it was such a sheer number. And out of those, you know, some are private, some are pub public sector. So there are, of course, characteristics that's different, but the size of the market is just huge. And with the timing also, um, as some of you are, um, are familiar with this uh, sector, you would know that China has introduced a second child policy um, recently, a few years ago. As a result of that, the education industry is booming with a lot of big companies moving into space. As again, you can see from the, just now the presentation, some of the companies didn't start with education, but now they are in this space. So there's a lot of money available in this. And also the sector is a key, one of the key areas for the government in the current um, five-year plan and the next one perhaps as well. So uh, from policy perspective, there's also a lot of support from the government. As with many other things, you also have the um, challenges to consider. IP risk is often um, cited as the biggest barrier for many tech companies, especially when your core assets is in codes, in it's really apps and software. So how do you practice, uh, practically protect your IP 
uh, remains um, a top priority for many companies first when they look at entering to the market. But there are ways uh, to help you mitigate those risks. Of course, uh, Chinese um, language is a huge barrier for many of the software or curriculum uh, providers because you have to get that right, which we'll talk about later. Um, and the language is uh, one, but the cultural side is another aspect. Uh, doing business in China is very different from you know, what you see here or in Europe. So that needs a lot of understanding, but again, it's not insurmountable. Uh, finally, I think uh, for many companies looking to enter China is where do they start and how do they access to that? So that is another challenge that needs to be looked at. So um, I guess for that, the question for you, for your particular company is yes or no, where pros uh, outweigh cons for you or the other way around. That's a question I will leave with you. But in the meantime, I will I can tell you um, from our experience working with other companies and how they did it, and hopefully that would be of um, uh, valuable reference to you. So this is a company called Steer, which is a, a UK-based education company with a solution based on um, SaaS, Software as a Service, um, to address uh, young people's mental health problems um, in the UK, of course, to start with, but now also um, in other countries. So when they um, thought about China, because what they read in China, um, the young people's pressure from the college entry exams, and in general, the competition for young people to excel in academic uh, studies has caused a huge um, problem in the Chinese young generation's mental health care. So um, the company CEO Simon, as you can see in the picture, um, he came to us to Crayfish um, after he's done some research. Um, he um, asked us whether we can help take the company into China. So we have then, since then, about um, less than a year ago, we have uh, gone through the journey of um, exploring uh, what China uh, is in terms of market for the company to actually going through uh, the strategy and implementation and till now the pilot project is ongoing now in China. So how did he do that? Um, I would like to just uh, quickly outline uh, those steps we have um, taken with uh, the company. So start with the strategy. Uh, we look at how do you start, um, you know, to look at the how, um, what are the uh, players you needed to involve, who are the people that's important, and then what product you take into China and if you have multiple products for example and also where do you start in terms of city or in terms of segment and and of course to protect uh, as we said earlier and to protect your IP is important to register and also make sure the branding and also the localization aspect of it and there were Quite a few trips happened, but to start, the first trip was very intensive with uh, visiting of uh, four cities in about um, uh, a week to uh, look at the market and to meet the people. So if we um, talk about the stakeholders, in the education system, um, there is not just a straightforward, you just go to one customer or uh, the customer base, um, it, they are multiple uh, stakeholders you need to be aware. To start with, the Ministry of Education would make the policy and, um, and which will be um, implemented all across the country. Um, and then you have also the think tank, in this case is National Institute of Education Sciences, which um, provides recommendation to the government, but they also um, do research and tests, experiments in, uh, across the country in schools. And so they have experts 
who can help advise you on what uh, China is doing in, for example, mental health, in uh, psychological uh, tests of uh, students, etc. And then there's end users you need to consider. In this case, the end users uh, would be the teachers and the, the head teachers. If you look at the picture uh, in the middle, that's where Simon uh, going uh, went into a school and illustrate why education shouldn't be a straight road, which is in the middle of the table. It, it's just happened to be a straight panel. So it was very good to illustrate that education should not teach the student just drive on the straightforward road because in real life there will be curls, there will be bumps that the student needs to learn to prepare themselves. And then there's budget holders. So in some cases, for example, if it's an international school, the budget holders will be the schools. But if it's public school, state-funded school, the budget holders normally are the local um, education commission. So they are branches of the Ministry of Education and they hold public funding. Um, and for bigger projects, this will be subject to tenders. But for smaller projects, the local commission can also procure directly. So you need to understand those. So just to explain what's happening in these pictures. So on the left, you can see Simon speaking uh, on the conference. This is like um, a tech, uh, um, TEDx kind of uh, talk. Um, so it was broadcasting to over 2,000 people across the country, but even in the audience, which you can see underneath, there are hundreds of teachers and head teachers who were very, very keen to hear leading edge concepts and solutions that uh, the British companies were able to bring over. In that conference, there were more than just one uh, companies from the UK to talk about the best practices in UK schools and what edutech solutions were there available to help the Chinese schools. So on the right, you see Simon shaking hands with Professor Wang, who is one of the leading thinkers in China to advocate um, the future school concept. Uh, for the Chinese children. And then you see a landscape of a city that is Shuzhou. And this is Shuzhou, uh, which is about 20 minutes by fast speed train from Shanghai, where um, the project is now being piloted to schools to implement uh, first stage curriculum to help uh, prepare the kids uh, for their health, growing to be a healthy child in, uh, in their uh, primary school. So here, what I wanted to talk about is to get your message uh, really accurately to your audience in China. We talk about language as one of the biggest barriers and it remains so. So if you want the information to be totally understood, it really needs to be well translated and make sure that um, you do take someone if you don't have uh, anyone uh, in your team, you hire, for example, a freelancing translator, or you can, or you can even use online uh, translation tools. Whatever it is, you need to make sure that your message are not wasted in the, are not lost in the translation. So in this case, in this uh, our case, Simon Heiss, uh, has uh, used one of Crayfish's freelancing. Uh, project managers in China who um, is an excellent communicator in terms of language, but also the support to negotiate uh, with the local uh, authorities. And of course, if you are uh, selling into mainland China, make sure you use the simplified characters, not the traditional characters which are used in Hong Kong and Taiwan. So, uh, Localization is important if your products have a lot of language element, uh, but also if it's in, um, in software um, and you need to look at how to do that in, on the other hand, protect your IP. And of course, there's a brand element that you need to consider. In China, if you come in with English brand, it's really not ideal, particularly for schools, for the end users, the parents and 
uh, and head teachers, etc., they're not used to use English brands for any um, of the solutions. So you need to have a Chinese name for your company and a Chinese brand. So in this case, um, we have uh, uh, done a proper branding exercise for the company to have a name um, in Chinese that express a similar meaning in its English brand because steer is a word that could be a verb but um, it could also carries various meanings um, in Chinese when it comes to carry the education element in it. Uh, so um, when you also need to for example have faces in your leaflets um, again in this case we have um, um, the company has actually used Chinese face to illustrate a child's journey through the pri nursery, primary, and the secondary school. So that also helps bring that distance closer to the Chinese audience because essentially it's English product, English solution. How is it going to work in China? You need to let people feel comfortable of that. So. All in all, actually, most important is to find the right partner. And who is going to be your right partner in China? That needs some proper search. Um, not, so sometimes companies would say, oh, I met a company at a conference and uh, they're very interested in being our distributor and that's where they start. But ideally, you should really um, have a few comparison. Look at who is your best partner. Ask them to build a business case around your product and make sure that if you give um, exclusivity, which typically uh, will be demanded from the, the, the Chinese partners. Uh, so you need to consider how do you give that with uh, attached with conditions, whether this could be by product segment or is it uh, target driven or it could be uh, related to um, certain product of yours, uh, you, it, the best way is to carve that out as uh, clearly as possible and give yourself the choice to get out of that if things do not happen as planned. And in fact, never expect things happen as planned because uh, not just in China, but the business environment generally um, happens to I mean, China is very dynamic, the whole market. Things happen very quickly and change very quickly. For example, I visited China two weeks ago, and now I've already heard back from one of the Chinese company. Um, I visited with another education uh, client of uh, ours that the Chinese companies decided to change their uh, business focus from one sector to another sector and another company we visited decided to change the name. So this is all happened in the last two weeks. So there are a lot of changes you need to be prepared and you need to be open-minded. When I say open-minded, it's to generally to the business model, to who you work with, to how you work with them. For example, they could be your distributor today, they could be your investor tomorrow. So having that flexibility in your mind, um, in uh, how you see um, things work in China would help you. So here I just want to um, explain a little bit what Crayfish offers. Um, we are a full service provider, uh, which means we do offer everything that you need to do business with China, whether these are strategy, or is it implementation, or just solving your language problem, um, or is it help you to hire someone in China? Uh, almost everything. We, if we can't help you, we will find someone in our network to help you. And we do also help you build very important connections in China. And this could be government, could be uh, stakeholders like we mentioned, think tanks, but we also run uh, webinars and events like uh, this, of course, at events, you can physically meet people and make that connection to yourself as well. We also provide cultural training. Uh, some of them are free on our webinar, on our website. Some of these are tailored to suit your particular needs uh, in your business. And finally, we do have a accelerator program where we uh, provide early stage funding um, in partnership with 
some anchor investors of ours uh, with Chinese um, funding. This at the moment are restricted number of sectors and we are hoping to cover education uh, sector next year as well. And if you do have a need for any services, you can use our online platform and that's where our technology lies. And you can use our marketplace to post any project, whether it's translation or business development or uh, sourcing from China or writing a Chinese article for you. You can get someone um, uh, responding to you and they will do that project directly for you. We do also have a fixed project, uh, fixed price. Uh, offering where you can click and select services from setting up a rep office in China um, to hold a focus group of researchers uh, such as like that as well as some basic cultural training element. Finally, if you have uh, questions and uh, for particular element of a service you want to talk to us, we do have a tailored services. And if you have multiple services with us or longer period of engagement, we can assign you a relationship manager to help you as well. So on that, um, we are finishing the presentation. Uh, if you can for now um, think about the questions and send it through to us, there is a Q&A panel on the bottom of your screen, sorry, not on the right, as I said earlier on. And in the meantime, here's our next webinar information. And um, just to say also the recording of today's webinar will be on our website, but also we will send it to you afterwards as well. So with the time limit, uh, we will only be able to answer two questions. So let's look at questions. Um, for now. All right, so we, we have now uh, one question coming through, which is, um, so how are, um, I'm sorry, let's see. Are there opportunities to sell license of education apps and software into China? So here I would bring uh, Dr. Li Yuan uh, in again to answer this question. Hi, Ting. Uh, I think the simple answer is yes, but the reality is uh, that is a complex business. So I'm not uh, an expert in this particular field. However, the challenge I anticipate comes thick and fast. You can't just uh, translate things uh, and cross your fingers. Uh, fingers. And uh, there's uh, lots of uh, very important, as you mentioned, uh, the localization issue. So you need to understand the Chinese education system, the teachers and the students. Most importantly, you need to understand the culture, the very real thirsty for knowledge in China. Okay, uh, that's, yes, I, I agree. So it's not straightforward, but there are opportunities. I have seen other uh, European companies uh, selling their apps into Chinese schools. But typically these are blended, integrated into the Chinese, uh, typically a, a set of software for school. Uh, for example, they have a platform with various apps uh, incorporated into it. So actually the users will not just see your app uh, on its standing alone. Um, but for the localization, it's important, not just language, but adapt to how the Chinese education system works. For example, um, there's teacher assessment, for example, this framework that to assess teachers, this quite, this, it is quite different how teachers are assessed um, uh, from you know, here, we you know, assess teachers, for example, probably health and safety is not on a high agenda in a Chinese school, but uh, perhaps the, you know, the, the uh, academic marks are much more important, etc. So, and of course, the way how Chinese teach, uh, teachers teach is different and how the apps are used, how the curriculum is developed, all these are different. So when you localize your, uh, when you, if you want to sell your education apps and software, when you localize them, you need to work with your partners to get that right. It's not just translation. Okay, the second question comes through now. So it's how easy it is to reach out to those companies you mentioned in the presentation with a view to collaborate. I think this is again a question for Dr. Yuan. 
to be blunt, I, I, it depends on what you're offering and how much they value that offering. Most uh, ID tech companies in China are very open to new ideas and opportunities for collaboration if you think you are good, a good fit. So there are lots of ID tech conferences and events in China, as I mentioned, that you can uh, attend. And most of companies will present their research and the new development there as well. 